Thanks so much for having me. I'm trying to make sure if my mic is actually on here. And we're gonna do this a little bit of a uh, fireside chat conversation, so I hope you don't mind me sitting down. And we're very lucky to be joined by Commissioner McSweeney, who's been at the FTC since April of 2014 on a term that will expire in 2017. You know, before joining the FTC, she was over at, at the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division and also served within the administration and before that with Senator, well, then Senator Biden's office. Uh, and she's been really sort of out on front of where the FTC stands on the Internet of Things. And that's really what we're going to dive in here today. And to open that conversation up, I'd love to really start by asking exactly the role that the FTC has in, in that space. Uh, sure. Well, I want to start by thanking everybody for being here and thanking you for being here and thanking New America for putting together this important conversation today. The Federal Trade Commission is actually a 100-year-old consumer protection agency, uh, but it has adapted its mission over the last 25 years to cover consumers as they move from consuming in a brick-and-mortar world to an online and interconnected one. So that's really the FTC's nexus to this conversation. The agency has brought more than 100 privacy and data security cases using its statute, which allows it to protect consumers from unfair, deceptive acts and practices. Uh, so as we examine um, the security practices around consumer data and the practices around consumer privacy as it relates to the Internet of Things, it's primarily that statute that we're using in our enforcement mission. But we also have uh, authority to study sectors, which we do periodically. Last year, we actually issued a report on the Internet of Things. Um, and you know, it, again, it's very important for us to understand um, kind of what's happening to consumers in real time. So we spend quite a lot of time um, investigating trends in the marketplace and trying to understand them so that uh, we can make sure that we have the right tools and the right um, enforcement mission. You know, speaking of your enforcement mission, one of your latest cases that I found was really interesting and involved the security of a major router manufacturer. And we talk about routers are sort of the hub that you expect everything that the Internet of Things, you know, whether it's your smart coffee maker, your smartphone, basically everything in your house to actually connect through. So you actually really want to make sure that thing's locked down, right? Uh, but how should consumers expect that? the maker of that smart coffee maker who probably doesn't have quite as much experience with security as, say, a router manufacturer or does is going to be able to keep that safe if even the router makers aren't doing their jobs. Well, this is, to me, the 21st century data security issue of the Internet of Things, right? Um, how do we get the balance right, and how do we make sure that companies that are previously making um, kind of for lack of a better word, dumb, unconnected appliances that are now making computer-connected, internet-connected uh, appliances um, understand what data security practices are and why they should apply even to that connected coffee pot. So yes, you're right. We actually recently, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, announced a consent decree with a major router manufacturer. Um, and in that case, we were looking at the security practices that the router manufacturer had. And of course, routers are a terrific frontline defense to your home network. Um, that's why we think it's very important that if a router manufacturer is making security representations, that those be truthful. Um, and we think it's very important that they have reasonable security practices. Uh, but what we can't just rely on the router as the first line of defense. Um, the fact is that a connected uh, appliance to your home network can be a portal into your home network. We've seen this, um, I don't know, connected tea kettles, sharing Wi-Fi passwords, right? So, and, and once you get into that network, you can really um, explore it. Um, and so that's one of, one of the issues. I also think it raises an additional really interesting consumer protection issue, and this is something that the Trade Commission identified in its Internet of Things report last year, which is how long is that product going to be supported by the company that's manufacturing it 
And what information do consumers need to have when they're going to a store to choose a new coffee pot or a new toaster oven? They might like to see this fun, exciting, uh, interconnected new capability associated with it, but will they understand that that might mean that that product will only be supported for five years or six years? And, and what do they need to know at that time of purchase? I've had my toaster oven for about 15 years. I suspect if I bought an internet connected one, it probably wouldn't make a lot of sense for the company making it to support it for that long. So should I, should I have information at that time of purchase to understand that this thing that I would have previously lasted me a much longer period of time um, is maybe not gonna last quite as long? And I'm really glad you brought up this sort of update situation because you know when I talk with security researchers about the Internet of Things, probably the joke I hear the most often is, oh, the Internet of Things that can be hacked, or oh, the Internet of Things that can be hacked to kill you when you talk <laughs> about things like connected cars or medical devices, mm -hmm. which really, if compromised, could have some really pernicious outcomes. Uh, and, you know, in fact, I believe, gosh, I think it was last year, may have even been the year before, the FDA came out and said, hey, hospitals, stop using this one specific kind of drug pump because there's a really potentially harmful vulnerability in it and they're not going to fix it. Where do you see sort of physical safety coming in when we talk about the Internet of Things? Well, physical safety is obviously a really important aspect of this. <clears throat> and if you think about certain connected aspects of your home, right? It might actually um, undermine the physical safety of your home if you're thinking about uh, connected alarm systems or connected locks or cameras and that kind of thing. Um, you know, there's another aspect to this security of these devices that I think is really important. Um, you know, it's, if they, if they um, are compromised, they might not work properly. Um, and it might be that they could also be used to launch denial of service attack either on your home network or be incorporated into a larger attack. So there's this other aspect of securing them that I think is really, really important and should be part of this conversation as well. Um, when it comes to things like cars, I think uh, you know, the automobile industry has a real opportunity to uh, understand and learn from uh, the information technology industry about how to secure its systems is absolutely critical, as we've seen in the last year in the conversation around really high-profile automobile hacks, because the public health and safety issues are so prominent in that kind of uh, consumer product. So and we've seen some of the connected, well, not connected cars per se, but auto manufacturers generally move into the space of offering like bug bounty programs like Tesla, mm. uh, GM also has done some interesting stuff, I believe actually with uh, Hacker, Hacker One, One yeah. uh, <laughs> about having third party researchers like come <clears throat> to them with problems. Is that a model that you think is effective? Absolutely, and you know, I, I've been, um, I should say, uh, at this point in our conversation, I probably should have said it at the outset, I'm here speaking on behalf of myself and not my colleagues at the commission or the trade commission. Officially, um, I've been pretty outspoken on this point, actually. Uh, you know, last year we saw in the NHTSA reauthorization um, a pretty poorly conceived approach to this uh, um, uh, issue, which was to outlaw white hat security researchers from doing research on connected vehicles. I think that's a giant mistake. You know, we, we absolutely need to have uh, the white hat community, the security researcher community out there helping the new industries that are new to connected consumer products understand how to secure them. And that's not just good security practice in my mind and having a good program that allows you to receive vulnerability reports, having a good program, um, if it makes sense for you, that is a bounty program or a conference program or a hackathon program or working with a platform like, like HackerOne. Um, you know, that's not, not just good security policy. Uh, I think it is also one of the most efficient ways to improve the security of your products. And that's not just my point of view. There's actually some economic research out there that supports that, that crowdsourcing and understanding uh, how to, where your vulnerabilities are and how to fix them is a very efficient cybersecurity investment. So, and you just brought up now uh, where NHTSA is on some of this stuff, or at least was at the time of those comments. How exactly does the FTC work with other agencies that are also interfacing with these kinds of issues? I mean, when you talk about like the FAA and drones, you talk about 
out obviously in uh, the Department of Transportation and in connected cars. What's that communication like and where do you see overlap that, and how do you manage that? Well, all right, so I, I don't want to blame NHTSA for a, a proposal that I think was floated in Congress. Um, I, I don't know where, where they are on these issues, but I do think um, the FTC has a real obligation to work with a lot of these expert sector regulators that are now finding privacy and security issues emerging in their mission. Um, so that's one thing that the FTC, I think, can really um, do as an agency and that we ought to do. It's part of good government, of course. Um, which is take our 25 years of learning and knowledge about privacy and security practices and help other agencies understand what our approach has been and, and how and why we have adopted the approach that we've, we've adopted. Uh, we have also seen in the last week um, some of our sister consumer protection enforcement agencies bringing data security cases, the CFPB obviously um, bringing its first case. You know, in general I think that um, we are in an environment where consumer data security is so essential for the success of the Internet of Things and for all of these incredible innovations that are going to bring such wonderful new products into our lives that I don't think it's the case that there needs to be you know, simply one cop on the beat. We all need to understand why this is so important and, and be able to share that information. So you're know, also speaking of other agencies, I'm going to bring up the E word, uh, encryption, which I think we're going to be talking about a lot today for some reason. Uh, so it does seem like there's a little bit of a gulf between where the FTC comes out talking about how we want to make things as secure as possible and where some security researchers say that what the FBI is asking I mean, Apple to do in the San Bernardino o case could potentially undermine in the security of devices. How would you sort of describe that difference? What exactly does the FTC think is the most effective path forward when it comes to encryption? Well, so again, I'm going to be sure to caveat what I'm saying by saying I'm speaking on behalf of myself here, since I'll just be the one to get myself in trouble as opposed <laughs> to my entire agency. Um, you know, I, I think what's really interesting about this, and this actually uh, came up in our routers case recently, and it's come up in some other cases that have been recent data security cases the FTC has brought. You know, we, we don't dictate what kind of technology companies should use to secure consumer data, and I think staying technology neutral is absolutely critical because this is such a dynamic space. That said, we have certainly noted that encryption can be an incredibly useful tool in securing data at rest and in transit. Uh, we have brought cases when a company, companies have claimed they are using strong security measures or strong encryption measures when they haven't configured them properly or when they are not, in fact, using them. And so um, I think that is, indicates, really, that encryption in, in the FTC's view is a very, very, very valuable tool in, consume, in protecting consumer data. Um, I think it is even more valuable if we think about all of the wonderful big data analytics that might be possible in the future. If we're, if we're also trying to protect consumer privacy, the prospect of being able to take large pieces of data that are encrypted and compare them to other data without ever invading the consumer privacy in that data um, is really, really exciting to me. So I, I think that we need to make sure that we aren't undermining the strength of that technology because I think it's going to underpin a lot of our data security and privacy in this brave new interconnected world that we're in. So that's why this debate around the iPhone case is so incredibly important. Um, in my view, I don't think it actually should be resolved by, by one case. Um, I think it's far too important uh, and critical a set of issues. And the trade-offs here for consumer data security are, are potentially very, very, very significant. So I, you know, I watch with interest the development of legislation that would suggest a commission. I think that might not be a bad approach to trying to find the right balance um, with the caveat that um, I think any conclusion that we ought to mandate backdoors would just be a disaster for consumer data security. So I feel pretty passionately on that point. <laughs> so you know, speaking of legislation, I know that 
in the past, there hasn't been a lot of movement on specific data security regulation and coming out of Congress. And it almost seems as though there's been more movement on privacy issues at the state level than at the national level. How does the FTC plan to sort of move forward in this space without necessarily the clear sort of guidance that you might expect when approaching, you know, some pretty uh, important areas. Right. Well, so you're right. There isn't comprehensive data security legislation. Um, I think actually the FTC as a whole has supported such legislation, not just to have one set of um, standards around how breach notification occurs, but also to have a set of standards around these, this IoT space that is clear. Um, we don't have that. I think we'll continue to support that, and we can continue to make the case for it. I think. The, the fact that consumer trust in the security of their interconnected products is emerging as a very significant issue. When you look at the consumer survey data, when you look at the Accenture report on adoption, you see that trust and security is, is becoming a very prominent issue in this space. So that might help both create the incentives for companies to make the appropriate investments, and it might also help ultimately support legislation in this space as well. Uh, but without legislation, I think you can fully expect the FTC to continue using its enforcement tool to try to uh, bring cases where there are not reasonable, reasonable security practices in place. And I think we'll continue to advocate as we do in our various initiatives. We have the Start with Security Initiative, which is an initiative that um, sort of lays out 10 principles of what reasonable security looks like based on the 60 plus enforcement cases that we've brought. And I think that's a really important contribution to this process as well. Um, you know, sometimes we hear, oh, well, we don't really understand what reasonable security is. What do you mean by that? Um, and I'm kind of incredulous about that when I hear it because I think, wow, in this, at this point, you know, in 2016, um, it should be pretty clear what, what security looks like. Uh, it looks like having a process in place. It looks like having people responsible for it. It looks like having training in place. It looks like having some ability to collect vulnerability reports and respond to them in a reasonable amount of time. You know, we have a lot of information that is now out there, whether it's the NIST critical infrastructure framework, whether it's the Start With Security Guide, whether it's our enforcement cases. Um, and, you know, I think this is a really, really rich space where there's a lot of really valuable advice for people. Um, and we're gonna continue to try to push it out there as much as we possibly can. You know, it's not our goal to, to catch people, uh, you know, and bring cases against them. It's our goal to try to protect consumer data security. Uh, we're, we really, really want to make sure that anybody that's trying to do the right thing has the best set of tools possible to do that. So the, one of the major roles of the FTC is to be an enforcement agency. <coughs> So, you're, but you're not sympathetic to the idea that some companies may not necessarily understand what the rules are in the current setup? Yeah, I'm deeply sympathetic to that. But <laughs> if they aren't making any attempts at reasonable security, um, they are doing that at their own risk, I think. <laughs> uh, so I guess my point is, um, sympathetic to the notion, I just think, you know, go on our website. There's <laughs> some pretty easy information. It's written in plain English. Um, talk to a security professional. <clears throat> talk to anybody that can give you advice. And I think the, the steps here are, are pretty clear. You know, at the FTC, we, we sometimes say, well, you know, reasonable security isn't perfect security. We understand that um, attacks happen, breaches occur. Um, so our standard isn't perfection here. That would be a huge mistake. And that's impossible, as any security professional will tell you. Uh, so, you know, the, the standard here is reasonable. It means having security by design, processes and procedures in place, and making a reasonable attempt to secure the information that you have. And the bottom line is if you put your customers at risk, you put yourself at risk of ending up in the FTC's sites. Yes. <laughs> and if you represent that you have, uh, that you're handling information securely and you're not, that can be a problem. Uh, I want to switch topics just a little bit to another sort of Internet of Things thing that I just find really fun. Uh, so I sort of feel like when we're talking about things like 
Siri or the Amazon Echo, which I guess this is the part where I make like the awkward side disclosure, which is made by Amazon, and Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos also owns the Washington Post. I do it <coughs> if I was writing about it, so I try and do it when I talk about it too. Uh, it can kind of feel like Star Trek. You know, you're just talking into the void and you know, say, make it so, and you, know, you play the music that, that you want. How do you feel like the FTC will go forward or talking about voice privacy like this when we're entering an area of where you know, we already carried microphones around in our pockets, but now we're having devices that are always listening to a certain extent? Well, I think it's a really fascinating issue. Um, you know, our, our touchstone for all of these issues is notice, choice, consent. So I think that that's got to be a part of this conversation, making sure that consumers understand how the technology um, is collecting their voice when it's on, when it's off, that kind of thing is, I think, part of notice um, and transparency. So it starts there. These products also are, you know, they're fantastic, but they also can create some interesting consumer protection challenges. Um, we saw that, for example, in the in-app purchase cases that the FTC brought about two years ago. Um, it, there was this great innovation in the app space where um, you uh, could more seamlessly, especially if you were a kid, buy a lot of stuff in a game. Um, turns out parents were caught off guard with the hundreds of dollars of charges their kids quickly racked up. Um, and so we brought some cases against Apple and Google, and actually we're ongoing litigation against Amazon on this one, <coughs> where we said, look, that's not, that's not okay. People need to have better, better mechanisms to control that. So when we have these new products that are fantastic, you know, the first question I asked was, how is it going to be, um, how, how am I going to prevent my kids from going, Alexa, buy me an iPhone? Because that's exactly <laughs> what's going to happen in like the first five minutes of, of this product being in my house. Um, so that's a part of the conversation that I think we need to have with industry. And I think it's a, a feature of some of these innovations that um, I'm really hoping folks in the product development phases are thinking about. You know, that's what security by design, privacy by design is. It's bringing in people with privacy, security, and then I would also argue data ethics values early in the product development life cycle. And, and having those values reflect uh, the, the, in the innovation, um, and you know, that can be a really terrific outcome for consumers. We can have fantastic new privacy data security products and features that will help us um, take advantage of all this innovation while protecting our, our privacy. So I think, uh, you know, if done properly, all of these problems, um, you know, aren't really problems at all. Gotcha. Well, I have been monopolizing you, which has been <laughs> a lot of fun for me, but probably not as much fun for the audience. Uh, so does anybody have any questions for the commissioner? I think they're coming with a mic for you, if you can hold on for just one second. You mentioned outreach when you go to the website. And I was wondering if you have spoken to other people, I mean, your counterparts, whether it might make sense to use the IRS tax forms for outreach, sort of like a notification with all the websites, et cetera, because all businesses and all adults are getting things from the IRS you know, annually. And so that uh, while a lot of the outreach programs are very good, um, I'm always surprised by what people don't know. That's a really interesting idea. Um, I, I don't think we've considered that, and I'm, I know the IRS has a lot on its plate, so, uh, but you know, I think we do, what we do try to do is um, convene around the country with non-traditional partners to get our information out. You know, the, the, most of the information, uh, the information that's sort of most popular on the FTC website is our idtheft.gov resources, which we've recently revamped, which are a kind of one-stop shop for people that are either concerned about identity theft or experiencing some form of identity theft. And uh, we're improving the remediation process there. So um, you're right, that might also be, a, um, given the problem of tax ID theft that is persisting, that might be a, a way that we share that resource. It's very common if you've been a victim of a breach, you've probably and gotten a breach notification. Within the notification, I generally find, having now gotten a few myself, that uh, the companies refer to our FTC resources in that letter as well, which I think can be um, very helpful. Yes? So I have a question. I'm, I'm the cybersecurity architect. And so 
he mentioned, he mentioned essentially notifying people through the IRS form. And so this directly kind of segues into my question about privacy. So if people like HackerOne or any researcher will tell you that when you say IRS and then that, that people scream, they get terrified. <laughs> and so the question I would actually, I have is, is there a working definition of privacy that is basically being used in the industry or have the researchers come up with one? I know we have a lot of intellectuals in the space here today. What privacy, what, do they, what does the FTC use as a working definition? Do we even have one? Well, thanks for the easy question. Okay. <laughs> um, so the FTC has used, I mean, this is, you're, you're putting your finger on, you know, the, the pulse, right? This is a big problem. Um, the FTC has used the FIPS uh, approach to privacy, right? So uh, notice choice, transparency, um, those kinds of issues. There is, you know, a huge debate in the policy space around what personal information um, should be held, you know, is, is sensitive personal information. In this country, we've adopted a sector-based approach to it, right? So we have HIPAA to cover, cover health information, although importantly, not health information you are sharing with your wearable, uh, just stuff that you have with a HIPAA-covered entity. Um, we have decided that children under 13 deserve some special protection, so we have COPPA. We think your financial information deserves some special protection, so we have GLB. We think student information deserves some special protections. It's a little unclear exactly what, so we have FERPA and a bunch of states. Um, <laughs> it's a, you know, this is a very, very hot debate. These issues of facial recognition, geolocation information, right, um, your voice information, uh, that is this wide open space that we are having, I think, a really rich conversation about. We need to continue to have one. And we need to be really mindful of um, kind of commercial surveillance in that space and how it's occurring. Um, you know, the FTC has studied this issue in cross device tracking. We've studied it in wearables. We're going to continue to deeply engage on it. But it is a, it's a big, broad, uh, tricky set of issues. And, um, you know, I think, I think we're going to continue to need to have a conversation about it. One thing the FTC does tend to focus on is when consumers are surprised by unanticipated uses of their information. And I think that that can be an area that, um, that we definitely will continue to explore. Um, and, and, I, and we've brought cases um, in the surveillance space when companies have said they're going to offer, offer an opt-out, the NOMI case, for example, but um, didn't actually provide that in retail locations, right? So that's where a, a company is tracking your, um, your location for the retailer. Uh, they suggest that on their website, they're gonna provide you an opt-out on their website, but also at the retail locations using the tech, but they don't actually do that. So then we, we say, well, that was deceptive. Um, it's not illegal to do that, by the way, if you, <laughs> you don't deceive people, but. Sure, I think there's a, do we have time? Yeah, oh, yeah. a few more minutes. We can probably get in maybe two, three more questions max. Uh, we've got some folks in the back here and I don't want to like give everything to this side of the room, sorry. <laughs> so uh, in the very back there. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ari Bass. I'm coming from the University of Exeter in England. My question for you is, what's the FTC's role in pre preventing back doors being installed in hardware produced in China or other places which don't have the greatest uh, privacy uh, regulations? Uh, yeah, well, we, we don't really have a role in that. Um, we can say, uh, look, we think back doors really undermine consumer data security. We can um, potentially take action if, if maybe company incorporates that hardware with, and, you know, especially if they know the vulnerability exists and then they make a bunch of claims about how secure and private it all is. If it's not, that might be deceptive. Uh, but, but we don't have jurisdiction to go after conduct that's happening offshore. So unfortunately, I think I actually overestimated our time a little bit and we may be out. Oh, yeah. That's yep, it. They said stop, stop in the back. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thanks today. for having me. It was a pleasure to be here.